It's been quite a while, huh? Well, Roblox, let's see what you have to offer us this time. Roblox and Horror, a combination as good as peanut butter and Poppy's Playtimes. Every time we check on this side of the platform, a new face is always brought to my attention. The first time, it was Picky, Doors, and Rainbow Friends. Last time, it was basically the same games again, but with the mimic thrown in there. But now, I can safely say we have a little bit more variety this time. Picky has been in a complete state for a while now. The mimic kinda fell off, if I'ma be real. And they're really hasn't been any word on the Rainbow Friends front for quite a while now, so there's really no need to cover those three games. And that makes you question, what exactly is there to talk about this time? I don't know, goddamn Mr. Uncanny's Tickle Funhouse of Play Hour, uh, fr friggin' secret lore of dress to impress. Just a mere few weeks ago, it feels like there wouldn't have really been anything to talk about. But in that time, seemingly out of nowhere, one of the most anticipated updates for any Roblox game ever had just been released. After an over two year long triumph, Doors Floor 2, The Mines has finally been released. And the response has definitely been mixed. So before we get into the game itself, I think it's a good time to mention some of the controversy that spawned from this update, because a lot of people were not happy. So I just want to start off by saying that I wasn't present for when the game was in the state people were complaining about. When the update initially released, I was actually at PAX West 2024, doing much more productive things with my time, like meeting Freddy Fat. Bear. So I just want to say right off the bat that I don't really have much personal input into how this discussion was like. With that being said, the drama can essentially be summed up as the new update being too hard and extremely underwhelming for the two year wait we had to endure for it. This sentiment being shared by many people, even the creator of Rooms, who complained about the time it takes to complete certain doors in the new update, which, like, I can understand, but you also made a game about not just walking through 100 doors, but 1,000, and a perfect run of your game takes about two hours of non-stop playing, so, like, I, I, I don't really think you have much room to criticize. But that was not even remotely close to the only person upset. My absolute goat, Creekcraft, also got frustrated with the update so bad that he had to rage quit. Also, shout out to Creecraft. That guy gave me like $1,000 from the reaction video that he made on my first Roblox horror video after it got taken down, and it helped me get in contact with a lot of people at YouTube support, so thank you, Creecraft. You can also still watch that video in full for free on my Patreon. Hmm, maybe you should consider. Anyways, with all of this controversy, L Splash eventually responded, basically just saying that the update will be toned down by a lot to make the experience more fair for casual players. Personally, I never thought Doors was meant to be a part particularly easy game to begin with, but if the rooms are as long as people say, I think making the experience more fair should be prioritized to not have people spend literal days trying to beat the game that you created. The major spike in difficulty was explained in a very simple way. The devs just got really good at the game while playtesting. The difficulty started to become a lot less extreme for them, so they didn't really even consider how hard the game might have become for the casual player. Ever since some current rework, the reception to the update has seemed to become much more positive all around, being able to be enjoyed by a lot more casual players. And even though I believe there are certainly criticisms to still be said about the update, I still think the general consensus has now changed a lot for the better. But with that being said, what did I think of it? Well, only one way to find out. Let's brace for impact and have the lights guide us through floor two. The Mines. But first... 
I'm not gonna beat around the bush. <laughs> and let you know, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the global men's lifestyle brand that is revolutionizing the landscape of men's grooming. I have had the honor of being sent Manscaped's new Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, featuring the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra Electric Trimmer. This thing is awesome, featuring dual skin safe blade heads, now accompanied by an upgraded trimmer blade and interchangeable foil blade for enhanced performance. The upgraded trimmer blade was the first thing I was sent in the package, and it now features longer, wider, and rounder teeth that cut through hair with ease. And personally, one of the best razors I have ever used. They didn't even tell me to say that at this part, I just genuinely really like this product. Though, the thing that is the real game changer is the foil blade. This foil blade is designed to leave you with a finish that is irresistibly sleek and utterly bare. To switch out the dual blades, simply start your trimming session using the trimmer blade, then easily pop it off and attach the foil blade to get down to skin level. The lawnmower 5.0 Ultra also has a bigger LED and introduces a dual temperature feature, thoughtfully engineered to embrace and flatter multiple skin tones. This trimmer almost serves as a tribute to the classics, upholding the best features from the past while improving on them tenfold. A rechargeable Lion battery RPM technology for top-notch performance, a travel lock for seamless portability, USB-C charging, a comprehensive three-level battery life indicator, Indicator, and the best part? It's still waterproof. Of course, Manscaped still offers well more than the trimmer, as the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is also complete with the Weed Whacker 2.0 Ear and Nose Trimmer. It's waterproof, cordless, and rechargeable. And guess what? It's built with skin-safe technology. This bad boy is designed to tackle those nose hairs with ease. And to top it all off, you will also be getting the Crop Soother and Crop Preserver, crafted to keep your skin refreshed and revitalized from day to nightfall. Enriched with colloidal oats, shea butter, providing essential moisture and soothing relief for the ultimate comfort aftershave. And for extra freshness, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. Designed to keep you smelling fresh whether you're rummaging through the mines or exploring an urban shade facility. When you purchase the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, you'll receive two free gifts. Starting off with the Boxers 2.0, they're tailored for the pinnacle of comfort and style and feature the jewel pouch. Manscaped also threw in their Shed 2.0, designed to fit all your grooming needs in one place no matter where you may be going. Join the 10 million worldwide who put their confidence in Manscaped for all things grooming and hygiene. Head over to manscaped.com to get your hands on the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra today. When you use my promo code DAGS, you'll get 20% off plus free international shipping plus free two gifts. That's 20% off plus free shipping and two free gifts with the promo code DAGS at manscaped.com. You're telling me I get to say balls one last time before we move on, so fellas, your balls will thank you. Now, let's get back to the topic at hand. Before we plunge face first into the mines, I think it would be good to go over some of very brief changes made to the hotel first, as some of the new content there will be crucial to better understanding the mines once we get down there. So, without further delay, What's new? Most of the changes to the hotel are purely cosmetic. There's a new title card that appears when you first spawn in, now stating the level, the infirmary, and the courtyard have gotten a very nice visual overhaul, and some speed modifiers were reworked. It'd be kind of trivial to go over all the new changes, but there are two standout ones that give us a bit more of a taste of what we should expect in the mines. First off, with the courtyard. The changes here weren't exactly just cosmetic. There's an entrance to a cellar that that, though interactable, doesn't seem to be enterable by any standard means. That's where a new item comes into play, the gardening shears. They can be found in these little wooden half closets, and are able to cut off vines that are either blocking entrances or have grown over chests. This will be a crucial item you'll need once you get to the second floor, being your main way of getting better and rarer items that were introduced in floor 2. Snares also have a chance to just randomly spawn down here 
here too, and I got so unlucky with his placement one time. Like, genuinely, how do you counter this? Nothing else is really to note about the courtyard other than dupe can now spawn in the greenhouse rooms, but like, you can also very clearly tell which room is which because the bars will be blacked out on a dupe door, so it really isn't that much of a challenge. The last change I'd like to cover with the hotel is the big one, and that's the figure rework. Figure used to be a fairly challenging obstacle when doors first came out, but he has since become way easier to understand as players got more use to the game and its mechanics. L Splash seemed to realize this, and gave him an insanely detailed buff, maybe that's what the U2s was foreshadowing this whole time. First off, introduced into the new figure overhaul is actually an item meant to make your experience a little easier. The alarm clock is a timed noisemaker that, when deployed, will send figure into a frenzy in the general direction that the clock is used in. This can especially be useful for people who aren't extremely skilled with his new AI yet, but still be careful on where you're using it, because even though it can be useful, it can backfire on you just as easily. The reason why a crutch was introduced in the first place is because of the new improvements made to the way Figure fundamentally works. Figure is now much more aggressive in his pursuit, breaking through what we considered safe barriers in the past that he couldn't typically walk through. This makes his walking pattern much more unpredictable than previously. This fact even follows into Room 100, making the ending much more difficult as well. Essentially, just be a lot more cautious around figure, as his pathfinding is much better and so is his hearing. And, as we'll see, this will prove to be essential knowledge for the moment we have all been waiting for. The Mines. We start off much more hectic than previously, our elevator crashing down to the lower floor after the events of the hotel. Despite this, we still have the ability to buy things with knobs if so desired. Our options this time being the standard flashlight, a bulk light, a hands-free flashlight, and a bandage pack. Now, you, you might already start to see the problem here. There's not really much variety to this buy menu like there was the last time. The hotel had two light items as well as two utility items. Lockpicks seem to be completely absent for this floor, and vitamins have become exponentially more rare, to the point where I don't even think they were included on this floor at the beginning. And while I can understand the removal of lockpicks because there aren't really locks anymore, the absence of vitamins is really disappointing, and I can imagine even more so for speedrunners. Not to even mention that the lighter was given more utility outside of just being used as a light source in the newest update as well making it even more distinct to the flashlight. Having three lights and one good utility item as the only things that you can buy on the buy menu this time around is really disappointing. I believe that vitamins should either come back to the buy menu or replace one of these flashlights with the glow sticks or something, because although those are still a light item, they have a little bit more different utility. Oh yeah, we'll get to those in a minute as well. The first room of this level gives us a really good taste of what to expect going further into the mines. With the starting puzzle being much longer and a lot more complex than the first one in the hotel, needing to find three fuses to power a generator in order to progress. It's here where you'll also likely encounter one of the most common items you'll find in the mines, glow sticks. They may seem trivial, but these things will become essential to your survival later on. They are permanent light sources that can illuminate certain sides of the room if you throw it. Yeah, I, I think you know what a glow stick is. And on the topic of new items, let's discuss some of the ones that were added to the mines. First off are the two new flashlights, the bulk light and the hands-free light. The bulk light is absolutely the best item introduced into this update, but it is also the most rare. It's just as advertised, a brighter light that has a much larger battery capacity. But with consumables such as batteries and bandages becoming much more common in this update, it's a fairly good chance that this item can last you all the way up until the end of your run. The hands-free light is definitely a novel concept, but I believe its introduction and practicality is weighed down tremendously. There's rarely a time where you'll need your hands-free as well as your flashlight, 
light, and on top of not really even being able to aim the beam at all, will make this item not that useful. This on top of the fact that if you're optimizing your playthrough, you'll likely not have your lights on for too long to preserve battery anyways. So again, fun concept, but the light is way too weak and its practicality is too niche to warrant taking up an entire slot in my opinion. The last two items introduced into the mines are very useful however, being a bandage and a battery pack respectively. Not only can you carry multiple of these items for yourself when you need them, but you can also be like a pseudo supplier or medic for your squad. These are genuinely fantastic utility items that make working together feel a lot more satisfying. I think the battery pack should replace the hands-free light or the basic flashlight in the buy menu. You can find all of these items while you are exploring through the mines. For the rare ones, typically in these rooms with the aforementioned gardening shears inside of these tangled boxes. Told you it'd come up again later. On top of all of these new items, you still have the chance to encounter vitamins, lighters, and even the crucifix. These typically being rarer drops in the overgrown chests that you can potentially come by. I believe a big part on why floor 2 feels a lot longer than floor 1 has to come down to the sheer size of these rooms compared to the ones on the hotel floors. A lot of the rooms in the mines having multiple branching paths with storage areas where you can potentially stop up on several items to make the experience easier. I found that a large reason as to why things took me forever on this floor came down to it being my fault for wanting to explore every nook and cranny of these new rooms that you aren't inherently obligated to do. You could theoretically beat the whole game with a very limited amount or even no items, but the insane spawn rate of useful stuff is always something that you'll want to be taking advantage of. While going through your first couple of doors in this new environment, you're likely to encounter a familiar face. Hey, hey, it's not dark in here. What's the big deal? Much like many of the old entities, Screech comes back for floor two, but you may notice it doesn't exclusively spawn in dark rooms anymore. This is certainly a change meant to make the game a lot more challenging, but also dark rooms have become a little less common due to being occupied by a new threat. We all already know how Screech, Rush, Eyes, Dupe, Halt, etc. work. Like even Timothy is back. The gang's all here. So I want to focus on more of the new faces that you'll be seeing in the mines, and oh my god, I didn't mean another literal face! Meet Giggle. I don't know if I love this thing or loathe it with every fiber of my being. Giggle is one of the more interesting entities down here, being what appears to be a smaller, retextured screech who hangs on the top of ceilings and will pounce on you if you get too close, attaching to your face and taking out a large portion of your health. Countering Giggle is as simple as either shining a light at them or, if you're feeling extra devious, throwing a glow stick at them, in which they'll make this noise. Giggles have the chance to spawn in any room, so make sure that you listen to their audio cue and act accordingly when entering. Earlier, I said dark rooms are not occupied by Screech anymore, but a new threat. That threat being Gloom Bats. Gloom Bats are a weird bat-moth fusion that attack light sources when spotted with one. So if you walk into one of these rooms with a flashlight on, you will be swarmed and slowly take damage. If you want to traverse these rooms while still being able to see, you can throw glow stick sounds for temporary light, as the Gloom Bats will attack and eventually put out the glow stick instead of you. You can also use their bioluminescent eggs to slightly see around your surrounding area. Just make sure not to step on them. And surprisingly, that's it for new characters. I'm honestly not that surprised, considering how solid the Doors cast already is. Every character serves a purpose that perfectly works into the core gameplay, so the things that you can potentially add onto those seem like it would be a little sparse. Nonetheless, I do believe the new additions don't take away from the core of the game itself, and work very well into this new setting this expansion introduces. I guess since we're still on this topic, I could also talk about Hyde, since it basically works like a completely new character. Hyde has gotten a complete overhaul since we last seen it in the hotel. It'll still kill you if you stay in a locker for too long, but if you exit that locker, you can see that it's lingering inside still. Trying to enter back in will now take a huge portion of your health and makes you unable to hide in any lockers for an extended portion of time. So if you're 
you're dealing with a character like Ambush, you're kind of screwed. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of this change, especially regarding Rush as mentioned previously. Instead of bedside drawers being the main source of loot in this floor, it's instead smaller metal lockers that can be placed right next to the enterable ones, making it very easy to accidentally enter a locker while just looting. And on some occasions, this mistake has costed me runs either because Rush spawned or I accidentally interacted with the locker again while trying to loot smaller lockers to the side. I think the idea of this change to hide is cool, but it was implemented in the wrong place. For this to work properly, I believe tweaks to the design of the lockers should be rearranged or at the very least just spaced out a little bit. Also, I think this change needed to be adapted way better to how Ambush works because it gets really confusing when you're playing with a large group. When it comes to new room gimmicks, we now got the- Nurse's the rooms where a gas leak supposedly happened, and if you stay in here for too long, you'll pass out and eventually die. And if you light a match, once you get to around room 20, you'll see someone peculiar drop down from the roof into the mines with you. Figure is now loose, and although you don't need to deal with him right now, it doesn't mean that you won't have to deal with him at all. Traversing further down into the mines, we'll get our first mini-boss of the level. Figure now stands in your path, needing to avoid him in this very linear room with his now improved AI. This is likely going to be the room where your run will start to plateau, needing to get a much better understanding of Figure's new pathfinding to outsmart it once more. But, of course, the task isn't impossible, or even that hard per se. Just keep your distance and pray Screech doesn't spawn next to you because Figure will hear it. After this, it should be smooth sailing for a while. Just look out for all the previous threats. And if you're able to outsmart all of the obstacles in your way for long enough, you'll eventually get to this long hallway with a drain. Walking further into the room... Zeke's chase this time around is much more intense than it is in the hotel, guiding light having you do many sharp turns and jump over broken bridges. It is very easy to mess this part up, especially on your first attempts. You just gotta make sure to stay hyper-focused on guiding light and make sure that you time your jumps accordingly, and you should be good. The jumping in this portion of the game can be pretty finicky, but to be fair, when isn't Roblox jumping finicky? Eventually, you'll run to a bridge that no matter no matter what, you can't make it to the end of, and you plummet below. Thankfully, we're thrown a bone by Guiding Light, who pushes a minecart towards us to continue the chase. Hmm, wonder where I've seen this before. All jokes aside, this sequence is really good. Your reaction time needs to be on point. It's literally the exact opposite of the Rainbow Friends minecart chase. This only goes on for five extra doors, but you can really feel that time in this sequence. Most of my early deaths were in this portion, but I never really felt like it was the game's fault. You just need to keep precise attention on the direction you need to go, and you should be golden. The chase ends not at room 50, but strangely enough, at room 49. The door closes behind Seek, but we haven't gotten out of our minecart just yet. Slowly approaching uncharted territory, we hear something grumbling in the distance. Before we have any time to react... <laughs> I hope you were planning on going right. Whatever the hell this thing is just derailed us from our tracks, and now the only thing we can do is run. Meet Grumble, or I guess I should say the Grumbles. These things are massive versions of the Giggles, and they seem to burrow through walls and stone like it's nothing. Much like getting to room 50 on floor 1 for the first time, this room 50 may take a ton of trial and error to finally nail. Just like the library, nothing is really explained to you directly. You need to just figure out your objective purely through context clues in the map itself. You start in a room with a terminal that needs to be powered up, 
Once on, you'll start to hear a ping noise go off, and the signal gets sent to another terminal right behind you. Put in the number displayed on the terminal into the other machine, and voila! Go repeat that for an extra four times now, oh my f***ing god. You need to listen out for another ping somewhere outside of this little area, and follow the signal to that respective location. Uh, oh yeah, there, there's also these things. There's more than one of these grumbles. I believe there's about six to seven to them total if it wasn't hard enough. Avoiding them can be an absolute bitch. They are faster than you, can turn in any direction, and when you make contact, they'll either throw you or straight up eat you. The best strategy I can say to avoiding them is to just make sure that the path ahead of you is illuminated, and pay close attention to the direction their sounds are coming from. These dark tunnels they burrowed are extremely nerve-wracking to navigate, and feel as if they are completely based on luck at times. This is a very difficult challenge for the first few times you attempt it, and it absolutely is a huge difficulty spike compared to the previous Room 50. The environment itself is extremely vast and sprawling, consisting of not just the burrows as previously mentioned, but many little maintenance tunnels and smaller rooms that shield you from the dangers of the grumbles. With no exaggeration, this is one of the hardest challenges I have ever had to face in a Roblox game. The grumbles are so unpredictable in the way they move, so there's a chance that you can literally just get cornered by two at once in oopsie daisy dead run on top of how long getting to door 50 itself even takes this led to me taking an entire week and over 20 hours of playing to even beat floor 2 once but with all of that being said i still don't even think this challenge was that unfair i still remember a time where the hotel's floor 50 was even this much of a challenge for me not to the same extent but i still didn't get it eventually with this floor i just started to get it, and I started to do pretty good consistently after. Do I still believe this area is a little poorly designed regardless? Yeah, a little. I think it throws a little too much at you, especially in single player, but they do throw you a bone in giving you one less terminal to activate if you're playing alone, but it also doesn't really do much. After trial and error, and error, and error, and more error, you get the goddamn point. You may just be able to lit the bridge down and run towards your escape. Oh my god, finally! With the grumble now closing us in, our only option to continue forward is heading down this ominous looking ladder in an area that looks far more industrial than previously. We can hear something coming from the other room. Music? Oh my god, it can't be. You have no idea how much I've missed you. Jeff's shop has returned, and with that, El Goblino 2, who I've had graciously sitting on my desk for the past week for good luck, but he has seemed to not give me much. The offerings from Jeff's shop this time around are a little less exciting than Floor 1, being made up of items you can just typically find. No skeleton key or crucifix type item here. Maybe we'll get something similar to that in the Mines Plus or something. Like before, El Goblino has a lot of witty dialogue about her current whereabouts, but there is a particular piece of dialogue that does stick out to me. Be careful in the agua, hombre. It's pretty dirty. Scary monsters can hide in there. This line is weird to me because there haven't really been any monsters that seem to come from water. Well, not yet, at least. Now, I know that you are all likely familiar with the 90 to 100 door challenge on floor 1, where you need to enter a greenhouse and everything gets way harder. Now, imagine that, but it's for the next 50 floors. Everything after the Grumble boss fight is basically a completely different setting. As mentioned previously, everything gets a lot more industrial looking. Almost as if we left the mines and are now in a sewer complex. From here, everything gets turned up to 11. Rush is way more frequent, Seek feels like it spawns every 5 seconds, almost every room is a dark one, and Dupe spawns in almost every single room. It's truly 
an endurance test of everything you have learned in the mines so far. Because of how much experience I had gotten with the first 50 rooms, this wasn't too hard to me compared to the boss fight. Just count the doors you walk into and listen for the audio cues you've come to be familiar with. Fortunately, snares also don't return to this floor, so you don't have to worry about those annoying things either. At around door 64, we're met back with another figure mini boss, this time being a lot more complex than before. Instead of simply just walking past figure, we now have to sneak around and collect three fuses to power a generator to our escape. Thankfully, the room is much more open this time around, and it isn't nearly as hard as it looks or sounds. Just continue keeping your distance and make sure you aren't opening any lockers if he's too close. If you manage to escape, you continue the same loop until you get to the final 10 doors, where we once again enter a pretty familiar room. Seek starts his chase once more, now being in a much more claustrophobic environment with far more room for error. If you thought you needed quick reaction time on the minecart, you're in for a ride here. We need to jump across several puddles that make up the same essence as Seek, but thankfully, something has seemed to place planks that make us a path. We go through what seem to be sewer pipes and drains until we make it to the fabled door 200. Walking inside, we are met with a goliath of a room, bigger than any room we have come across thus far. It's quiet. Almost too quiet. I guess we know what El Goblino was referring to now. Seek's boss fight is awesome. It's challenging, but not nearly as much as Room 50 is. Not to mention that this is quite possibly one of the coolest set pieces to ever come from a Roblox game. Our goal is to find and turn a set number of valves on different levels of this facility in order to send Seek down a drain. To achieve this, we need to do fast and somewhat precise parkour around the area, which could definitely be a bit finicky at times, but the fact that Seek's goop doesn't immediately kill you makes this a little more forgiving. If you manage to get him down to the final level, Seek will start throwing giant freaking fish creatures at you, so make sure you're on the move. This part is certainly challenging, and I did die on it on my first go around, but I didn't feel nearly as screwed over as I did during my deaths on Room 50. If anything, most of my frustration at this death was just over having the two floor 50 again, but if you manage to get all the valves in time, you flush Seek down the drain and can finally make your way to your escape. We head up a long ladder, that familiar, calming motif slowly fading in. We make our way up to the surface in a dark, foggy forest with one path in front of us. Walking down this path reveals a castle with no other choice we head towards the main gates. Seek, I cannot thank you enough for killing that bastard. I have very mixed opinions on Floor 2 of Doors. I'd consider this a worthy successor to Floor 1, if not better in some aspects, but the challenge it presents will definitely turn off a lot of players. Some of the rooms being too long is absolutely a valid criticism, but you can speed through a lot of the rooms pretty decently just as long as you don't try to explore every nook and cranny of each room, especially considering that 
that scavenging for items in this floor feels like this. I can understand why this expansion may not be for everyone, and I really wouldn't blame you if you don't have fun with this update, but after a really long time of playing, you just kind of start to get it. I wasn't even able to get a single terminal the first few times of doing room 50. Now I can consistently beat the puzzle after hours of trial and error. In that sense, I believe Doors 4-2 achieves the goal it always set out to be being a roguelike horror game. I think a lot of people forget this, but roguelikes aren't meant to be easy games. The experience is only meant to get easier after error and error of past attempts. Every death is meant to make you adapt to something differently in your next approach. A game like Hades or Risk of Rain 2 wouldn't be fun or interesting if you can just beat Hades and Mythrix on your very first run. Do I think the core gameplay could be tweaked to be a little more engaging and make the loop feel not not as repetitive? Yes, definitely. I feel this update relied on mainly the setting, and not too much on the actual gameplay changes. If there's anything I'd really wish to see from the castle, it's to make the game feel a lot more different from Floor 1. Introduce mechanics and changes that could potentially heavily differ from the first two floors. Maybe even lean a lot further into turning the game into a proper roguelike. The foundation is clearly there, it's been there for more than two years now. I believe L Splash and the rest of the team should absolutely look into taking a little less from rooms or spookies, and start taking more from their roguelike contemporaries going forward. There's a lot of miscellaneous things I love about this expansion too. The environment and level design, although confusing at a first glance, are pretty damn top notch. The mines feels a lot more imposing and threatening compared to the hotel. There's not many rooms in here that make you feel comfortable outside of, like, Floor 51. The new songs that are introduced into this update are also absolute freaking bangers. I believe a very overlooked attribute to Doors is absolutely its OST, but the new songs introduced in this update are some high-tier shit, especially Seek Phase 1, like, listen to this. If I had to give closing notes, Doors, Floor 2, The Mines is a solid, difficult, and longer expansion of Floor 1. It'll certainly test your patience at times, but if you're willing to adapt towards every obstacle and death you'll face, you may just be able to overcome those trials with ease. And I personally believe there's nothing more satisfying than that. Phew! Alright, so that's everything included in the Doors update. Now we can finally move on to- oh my god, are you kidding me? So there was actually a lot added to this game since we last checked in. A whole smaller expansion, basically. But before we cover that, let's rapid fire some smaller things first. Modifiers were introduced not long after I made my last video. It's basically just changes you can make to a game that'll make it either easier or harder. It's pretty pretty self-explanatory. There were actually a lot of changes to the rooms, mostly visual like fog and the ending area being a lot more purple than previously, but you may also notice that the reward item is completely different. This is a barrel of starlight. This item essentially just allows you to tank hits from enemies that traditionally insta-kill like rush or ambush. Probably replaced because L Splash realized how sh** the scanner was. Like previously, I would play this myself to get proper footage of it, but like hell I am going to do that, I'm sorry, it's just way too long. There was also a new entity introduced to the hotel named Dread, who only shows up if you spend too much time in a room but are not AFK. I probably should have brought that up a lot earlier, but I forgot to, and it's my video, I do what I want, bitch! And that basically covers up all the smaller additions added since last time. Now, let's talk about a major addition we have previously glanced over. 
But before we dive in, we need some prior context. Last year in around March, Roblox had hosted an official event called The Hunt. Basically, from what I can gather, this was a big world you can join that can take you to one of 100 partnered games for the event where you can earn exclusive cosmetics and stuff. And one of those partner games just so happened to be Doors. But it seems Splash wanted to go all out for this event and created a whole new expansion exclusively made for it, this being known as the back door. When the event was actually going on, this expansion was playable for anyone who had just joined the game, but is now only accessible through first getting the detour achievement, the achievement you get when entering the rooms for the first time. From what I'm able to gather, the back door works as an alternate retelling on how we got into the hotel. Instead of entering straight through the lobby, we enter through, well, the, the back door. This floor consists of just 50 rooms, going from negative 50 to zero. And despite being a short challenge, it is absolutely a challenge nonetheless. It took me a good hour in order to get a decent run on this thing, and you may start to understand why. The back door starts off simple enough. We're in an area that doesn't look as polished as the hotel itself, but still not as imposing as the mines. It just looks a lot older than the hotel. After doing a simple puzzle in the first room of the floor, we're immediately met with something pretty sinister. A timer, which we have only extended by another minute. Eerie ambience sets in after this, setting the mood for these next 50 rooms. The entities you'll find in the back door, although minimal, are some of the tougher threats you'll encounter on the hotel grounds. First, let's address that timer we saw. This is in place because if you don't pull the occasional levers that you'll find in the back door, it'll spawn haste the main antagonist of this floor. Haste works almost like a failsafe if you were to run out of time, changing the room to a dark, staticky red once spawned. Being able to see its texture through walls rapidly approaching you, which is an absolutely nightmarish image, may I add. If haste catches you, it's a dead run. Hiding in a closet or trying to avoid him is not gonna work. The only way you can counter haste is if you are lucky enough to switch a lever just before it gets you, but this situation is very unlikely. The second and most prominent entity found in the back door is Blitz. This character works like Russian Ambush, but is way more unpredictable in its methods. Blitz has the chance of just passing through like Rush would regularly, but he can also rebound like Ambush does, making it a gamble on how long you need to stay in a hiding spot. Thankfully, Hide doesn't seem to spawn on this floor, so you won't have to worry about that. The third and final entity entity you'll encounter on this floor is known as the Look Man. He functions like eyes, because this is actually the beta design for eyes. Instead of rapidly damaging you when looked at, the Look Man will take away one chunk of your health before teleporting to a different side of the room. Countering him is about the same as eyes, you just kinda need to keep your head down. The final entity, if you could even call it that, is Vacuum, and it kinda works like dupe. If you open any non-important subdoors in a room, it has the chance of sucking you into the vacuum of space. This obviously will be an instant death, and it makes going into the side rooms not a very ideal thing to do in this game mode. As for items on this floor, the only real item you will find is a bottle of starlight. This is like the barrel of starlight we previously talked about, but coming in just one use. This functions basically the same as the barrel, it speeds you up and allows you to tank hits from characters such as Blitz. Super useful on this floor, thankfully not that uncommon. If you're able to learn and understand all of these mechanics, there's a chance you may just be able to beat the back door. Getting to the end reveals you can actually just buy a barrel of starlight for 100 gold if you want. But I didn't have 100 gold, so I just exited into door 0000, which in turn spawns us right at the beginning of the hotel. The back 
back door is certainly a fun little side expansion to the main game. Nothing too crazy, but for being made for an event not many people even talk about anymore, its inclusion is very impressive. I really like side content like this a lot, as it only adds to the experience Doors is trying to create. Though I think the placement of levers can be a little unfair at times. Phew! Okay, looks like we're finally done with Doors. I can't possibly even consider <laughs> Okay, it's tradition at this point. You can't avoid it. Doors is very notorious for doing its April Fool's updates each year as the tradition passes, and this year was certainly no different. At first, I thought it wasn't anything too substantial. It just seemed like voice acting was added to the main game, which is like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of funny. <laughs> That was until I found out about Doors Retro Mode, and I have to admit, I like this so much more than Super Hard Mode from last year. And I can't play it. Yeah, I thought I could, but I literally can't. So after the update was phased out, the mode was converted into a modifier called Survive the Draco Bloxers. But for some reason, with the introduction of the Mines update, it was completely disabled and it isn't playable until further notice. I did not know this until looking at the wiki, however, so I wasted an hour and a half crucifying eyes in hopes of unlocking the modifier, then just staring at this page for 30 minutes in hopes that it would just magically appear. I did actually get to play the event while it was new back in April, but I unfortunately didn't record this, so I should just give the exclaimer that this footage that you'll be seeing from this mode is not mine, and I'll be covering this portion of the game very briefly. Retro mode is exactly what it advertises itself to be, making the game look like it was built in 2008 Roblox. We got the classic gear and these beautiful seek and figure morphs, and as soon as we step into floor one, we are given the prompt, Draco Bloxers will arrive in 700 seconds, prepare. I'm unfortunately more of a new gen Roblox player, only really starting to play the game 2016 onwards, so I had no idea what these were at first. First. Through a bit of searching, I found this paragraph written by user Chris13 all the way back from October 2008. Let's give it a read, shall we? This is the true stories on how the Draco Bloxers started. A guy named Papa Smurf wanted to make a dragon fight place, so he searched but found no dragons. He decided to make a dragom himself, but he named it something different, Draco, the Latin word for dragon. Bloxers, duh. I got a message from him telling me to come to his place, and let me say, now for all to hear it, it was the best place ever. But then, Draco Bloxers died out, but he still made it again, but better scripted, however. I thought it wasn't as good, however. It was still great. And then someone said, what if these guys attacked and you had to build to survive? I soon heard nothing from him for a month. However, one day, I saw Build to Survive Durko Bloxers, and then you all know what happens next. But... Why tell this? Because it is the ultimate example of trial and error. The end line about Build to Survive Draco Bloxers apparently being the ultimate example of trial and error is poetically ironic, considering what these things would go to inhabit. The update is very short, being able to be beat in 10 minutes if skilled enough. All things considered, the gameplay isn't all that different from base doors. The biggest difference being that every door needs to be manually opened, and so do closets when entering them. The biggest difference comes from Floor 12, or a... <laughs> what the fuck? The figure chase has changed a lot from the source material, now being a parkour course where you can't step on the red. Seek has also been downgraded from an articulate action figure to a Happy Meal toy. This room isn't necessarily hard, but if you're gonna die anywhere in this update, it's probably gonna be here. It's pretty self-explanatory, just be smart about your approaches and you should be okay. The obby theming will follow into later doors as well. 
needing to do one at around door 20. Make sure you do it quickly. Every time you fail will mean the Draco Bloxers will spawn sooner. After the obby, you'll also be able to go to Jeff's shop, which doesn't seem to have much. Jesus, what did they do to you, El Goblino? Pressing on forward, you will make it to the courtyard, now filled with plenty of billboard advertisements. The final stretch, instead of being the figure fight, is instead more parkour. I really hope you're good at jumping for the beef. If you are able to make it to the end, you are able to stand on the pressure plate that got you the so retro achievement. After that, you would go back to the lobby or die like in this footage that I've been playing. Why Why did you decide to look at eyes with 1 HP, C Chrono? There's a lot more I absolutely could have touched up on this update, but seeing as I'm not able to actually play it, I saw it best just to skim through. But with that... I believe we are done with doors. Like, like, actually this time. If it hasn't been obvious by now, I really like this game and what it's been evolving into over the past two years now. I'd say more, but I have already spent what is likely over a half an hour already telling you as to why. For now, I think it'd be an appropriate time to close this door once again and open it back up when the time is right. Jeez, talking about doors for over 40 minutes really put me under some pressure. Oh, god damn it. It's hard to think of as many Roblox games that have taken over the zeitgeist of the platform so exponentially fast as Pressure. A game I got made aware of over a year ago has been silently brewing in the background this whole time, and when it finally released, it certainly made a splash. <laughs> Get it? Although I vaguely remember seeing a tweet from years ago showing off a demonstration of what Pressure could be, it was simply something that showed up and I immediately forgot about it. Out after. And it's a shame too, as it seems I missed out on a lot. Pressure would continue to be developed as the year went by, with early access tests of the game occasionally going live as far back as December of last year. For the sake of time and clarity, I won't be going over much of the early builds of the game, as I wasn't around to experience them myself. Just know that they also had an April Fool's event this year that introduced items such as the, the Sprog Light, which had a decal of dog day on the bulb. There was also the educator, and I think now's a good time to move on. As we continue to get more into detail about this project, you will start to see that Pressure is a game that wears its inspirations on its sleeve. Like, literally the description lists all their inspirations. Although the core gameplay is obviously inspired by doors, the aesthetics and world building take many beats from the SCP Foundation, Ultra Kill, and Iron Lung. This inspiration goes even beyond the source material too. A ton of NPC in the game are even voiced by Gianni Matragano, the certified golden boy of New Blood Interactive. This is bullshit. You let Sebastian Sola see. Being a fish is an important step on a person's life. How about you read a fucking book? He's primarily known for voicing Gabriel from Ultra Kill, but he'll always be the Gloomwood Huntsman in my heart. Axe goes in, blood comes out. Axe goes in, blood comes out. In this game, he voices the big-ass fish that everyone in their mother simps for, but we'll get to him later. After putting hours into this game, there is so much I want to say about it, what I feel it's lacking, and other things I believe it blows its contemporaries out of the water in. <laughs> okay, I, I really gotta stop, I'm sorry. 10, 20, 25. You are an inmate of high security prison. Your crimes are irrelevant. Whether or not you were falsely charged is irrelevant. You have served 93 days of your, s <laughs> your sentence. Today, three men from the Urban Shade Corporation, being escorted by heavily armed guards, arrived at the prison. They were searching for draftees to help them retrieve a crystal of sorts, a highly important asset that they were unable to secure during a major security breach in one of their facilities. They stated that the risk of death was high, but whoever could retrieve the asset and return it to them would be pardoned, release of a cleared record, and receive cash. Many of your fellow inmates signed up. You signed up as well. You are expendable.
you are not expected to return. After this, we are taken to the lobby for the very first time! Even just with a wall of text, the opening of this game sets up that your adventure is going to be much bigger than what you'll be able to see at a first glance. The game opens and immediately tells you how expendable you are. You aren't the first person to go on this expedition and you likely won't be the last. You probably made the connection already, but this monologue is heavily inspired by the same text given to you at the very beginning of Iron Lung. Outside of needing to go on a diving expedition, both games make it known to you straight away that you don't matter. The people you're working for do not care about you, and you're going to die. Honestly, it just sounds like the average American minimum wage job experience to me. I'm just gonna stump you. You're gonna keep coming back. I'm gonna seal up all my cracks. You're gonna keep coming back. The lobby is where all the other players will pile up in squads, and this actually made me think about something. A minor problem I always had in regards to the door story is the fact that the lobby just genuinely doesn't make any sense. In canon, we're meant to be a lone protagonist, maybe four if you want to stretch that multiplayer as canon. But having this giant social lobby takes away any of that immersion you could have had until you're deep into the actual game. Pressure's lobby makes a lot more sense. You're not the only inmate that was recruited to go on this mission. You're one of several hundred several thousand maybe. Everyone is loading up to go to the same place around you, all of them likely not returning. It's a very, and I mean very minor nitpick to doors, but it just goes to show how much attention to detail is in pressure. This attention to detail won't just stop here, as you'll begin to see. The starting lobby gives you a good taste of what the urban shade facilities look like. Unlike something like the Iron Lung universe, the world we're inhabiting doesn't seem to be in as dire of a state. At least it isn't known to be for the average citizen. In this regard, urban Shade is something more comparable to the SCP Foundation, seeming to have the goal of capturing and securing anomalies in containment. On top of this, both organizations seem to have no qualms in using high-security prisoners as cannon fodder. But enough twiddling our thumbs in the lobby. We have a job to do. Load up into your submarine with companions, or don't. It's not like your outcome will change much. Welcome to your submarine. You won't be staying here long, as you're heading straight to the Hedel Black site in order to retrieve that crystal. Much like doors, you're given a buy menu for when you start. Your only options as of right now being a flashlight and a code breaker, essentially the equivalent of a lockpick in doors. This buy menu may look small, and well, that's, that's because it is, but depending on certain challenges or milestones you reach, more items will unlock as time goes on. One of these items in particular being very interesting, but we'll talk about that later. Depending on if you bought something, the item won't just spawn directly in your inventory. Instead, it spawns in a box outside of your submarine, waiting for retrieval. Do you know how risky it is for me to get this for you? So ungrateful. Oh, piss off, you box. I'll likely be saying this a lot, but the attention to detail here is really cool. Everything feels like it's happening for a reason. If the game can avoid making you feel like you're in a game, it will. Everything in the world makes sense, and I think that is extremely impressive for a Roblox game. If this is your first time playing, you're likely going to be given this longer introduction on your current task. Thank you. 
Proceeding forward, it is likely you'll start to hear faint music playing. This song is called Park on the Old Mountain. This is one of the four songs that can play when you first start up your run, and it's my personal favorite. The song even has an official description. The mountain was just a small hill, but to a child, it felt like a mountain. This song's implementation into gameplay is absolutely genius. The OST of Pressure is absolutely phenomenal. While the soundtrack of Doors has this funky, vaguely lo-fi feel to it, Pressure's is a lot more grand and melancholic, and resonates with me a lot more personally. This isn't to say that the OST in Doors is bad. I love them both, actually. I don't bring up these comparisons to put Doors down. I bring them up because so far, this this game has done everything a spiritual successor should. The music feels like it speaks to you in this game, the orchestra sounding like it has a personality of its own, and I think the best example of this is, well, the park on the old mountain. The music will continue for the next few rooms, but at around door 10, the lights will flicker, and you're given an ominous message. This is your only indicator for an event like this. For now on, you're on your own. Pressure is a much less predictable game than Doors, not in the sense that you don't know when the entities are coming or not, but more so in random events just happening in the game. It feels like at any time you'll get a random intercom announcement that'll play on your journey, or walk into a room made of spirals, or see a giant set of chatter teeth inside a cell. Every run feels so much more different than the last. It's extremely refreshing, considering how good I had gotten at Doors over these past few years. The entities in this game are also pretty cool. The most common, and the one that you'll most likely die to first, is the Angler. This is the Rush equivalent to this game, and works exactly like how Rush works. The lights will flicker, and you'll start to hear a noise in the distance. Hide in a locker, or in a side room, and wait for it to pass. It also turns out all the lights in the room just like Rush. This is my biggest criticism of the game. Not that there's a character based on Rush, but the fact that there's eight. These entities are known as Node Entities and they have a whole page dedicated to them on the wiki. Lightning round for these guys real quick because there's not much to be said. The most unique out of the bunch is definitely Pandemonium. If in a locker while Pandemonium is active, it'll try everything it can to get you out. To counter it, you need to do this mini game where you keep this dot in the middle of your screen while your cursor is thrown around like crazy. As the sequence progresses, the mini game gets harder, with the monster starting to push your locker, sending your cursor flying. This mini boss also has insanely good music. If you survive, it'll leave and you can continue your run. This monster is very rare, at least from my experience, so hopefully you won't have to worry too much about it. Blitz is the second node variant, and he's just a faster angler, that's it. Pinky is a pink variant of angler, who does not warn you via light flickers that she is approaching. Frogger is the next one, and works as the ambush of this game. It'll rebound after passing through a room once, so make sure that you're safe and secure. The final canon node entity is Chainsmoker and it's actually one of the more unique ones. Chainsmoker likes to take its time far more than any of the other nodes, emitting a green smoke that makes you panic in small spaces. If you get into a locker too early while Chainsmoker is pursuing you, it'll throw you out of the locker, and you'll be teleported to this green wasteland with Pandora's box in the middle. After the sequence, you will be killed. The node entities aren't my favorite, but I understand why there's so many of them. It's a very easy type of enemy variant to just copy and paste. And I'll still admit that the art on all of these guys is pretty damn killer. The more entities that you're likely to run into have a little more going on, though. Squiddles are a type of entity that spawn in dark rooms and are a weird combination of screech, eyes, and gloom bats. If you approach them too quickly and don't break sight, they'll jump scare you like a FNAF 3 fan and take away a portion of your health. If you shine a light at them, it doubles this process and you get injured.
injured or killed way faster. The faces on the Squiddles can vary exponentially, and there's a lot of original art made for the faces of these characters but they can also have the chance to be references to pre-existing properties like I'm Scared, or the the, the Troll Face, or the, the, the Post Respect. What, what are you doing here? Instead of having Clyde's face on the Squiddle, I think it should have been this image instead. The second and most common entity is Ifestation. This is a giant, multi-eyed fish that has the chance of spawning in rooms with windows. If it's in this room, it'll attempt to force your character to look at it. If you do, it'll start damaging you. If you also get an item called a flash beacon, you can actually change the color of its light to red and then to purple. This also makes it extra hostile, so if you really need to end a run for whatever reason, this is a go-to method. There is also this kind of funny controversy regarding the gender of the fish and how it was apparently supposed to be female and not male, but the creator of Sebastian wanted it changed to just be male, which, like, I I'd understand if you wanted to design Ifestation as a woman, but it it it's a fish. If you were to ask it its pronouns, it'd probably go... Another fairly common entity that you'll encounter is simply known as good people. These things will hide in rooms with the same number counts and will try to bait you into entering their room. If you're foolish enough to fall for their games, they will slash at you from behind the door, taking away a significant portion of your health. The way to counter this is by listening out for audio cues. If you hear heavy breathing from inside the door, it's a fake, and you should proceed to your other options. I know this is meant to be the dupe stand-in for this game, but I honestly like the approach of this way more than I do dupe. I don't know if you could have picked up on this while I was talking about doors earlier, but I don't really like having to count every door I enter through, so instead giving me an obstacle that plays more on the context of the room itself rather than on memory is something my single cell pea brain can comprehend much better. Another entity, if you can really even consider it one, are the turrets around the facility. They function just like how you'd expect. Stay out of their line of sight or you'll be turned into fish paste. There are so many more entities in this game, but a lot of them are extremely rare. I'll talk about a few more in a much later portion of this video, but I do encourage you to play this game yourself and get surprised by the sheer amount of stuff that is actually in this game. Or just read the wiki like that, I, I don't know. The final entity that I'll touch up on for now is the Wall Dweller. These things have a low chance of spawning from inside the walls of the facility. It has the ability to follow you, and will kill on sight if it gets too close. Though, if you look back at it, it'll freeze in place. It's like a weeping angel entity. I bring this one up in particular because if you were to get a node enemy and kill a wall dweller, you can actually pick up the chunks of it and eat it. Eating it causes you to- I think you got the extra yummer in there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yummers. Hmm? Since we're vaguely on the topic of items now, let's touch up on those a bit. You got your standard stuff, flashlight, lockpick, lantern, medkit. These are going to be the items you'll likely find the most during your venture into the Hadel Black site. More unique items you can stumble across are the hand crank flashlight, a light that has very limited use and a low beam, but is infinite when cranked with a lever. A black light, which also gives you limited visibility, but is immune to squiddles. And the flash beacon, a 20 use item that emits it's a huge flash of light into your room on a cooldown. It's like the one you gotta use in the Funtime Foxy auditorium section in Sister Location. Now, I said that you're likely not going to find these items too much through common means. So, how exactly do you find these items? Well... Got a selection of good things on sale. Okay, I avoided you for long enough, I'll talk about you, goddammit. Everyone, meet Sebastian Solis, the Jeff of Pressure, also the Guiding Light of Pressure, and technically the El Goblino of Pressure. El Goblino solos you, little bro. Even if you're not familiar with Pressure, you've probably seen this fish bastard's face plastered all over YouTube shorts or your TikTok for you page. He's even right front and center of this thumbnail because I know what you are. Depending on how good you are at the game, this 
may have not even been your first run-in with Sebastian. I mentioned that he also works as the guiding light equivalent to this game, meaning he speaks to you at the end of every run. The first few times, he actually makes an attempt to be helpful and make you aware of what you died of, but if you keep dying to the same monster, he'll just move to mocking you instead. You really suck at this, huh? And I'm not taking shit from a dude that has a light bulb growing on his forehead. Sebastian's most prominent role is serving as your shopkeeper when you get halfway through your expedition. He can sell you anything from spare batteries, health kits, code breakers, or illuminative items. There's also one more thing he can sell you, but we'll save that for later. One thing you'll quickly learn about Sebastian is that he is very talkative. I don't know how much of this game's budget was spent on just getting these voice lines alone, but Gianni has recorded over 50 unique voice lines for Sebastian. And no joke, I felt like I would hear a new line every single run I do. And trust me, I've done a lot of runs. This character has absolutely become the main thing people have attached to regarding this game. And although he has much more that we could discuss, his role to the current task at hand ends here for now. So we say bye to our blue buddy and continue down the Hedel Black site. From this point, you're more likely to be walking through heavy containment areas. These places essentially just have larger doors that take more time to open. You have the chance to find a bunch of strange and miscellaneous items here, ranging anywhere from giant chatter teeth as mentioned previously, to a prop pistol, to uh... I HATE YOU! Again, a lot of interesting stuff here, but we'll touch on it more in a bit. You repeat the same loop of dodging the threats you've slowly become more familiar with, until you get this announcement on the internet. Need to go to You're now greeted with two rooms with generators you need to repower via DVD skill check. Simple enough puzzle, if you've ever played Dead by Daylight, you'll most likely get the hang of this immediately. Completing these two rooms, you hear a noise, but not any you've become familiar with up until this point. And if you're fast enough, you may even be able to see it. Getting to the end of the room, these huge doors open to a very special site. That's right, our door 50 boss is actually on door 60 something. Meets Pressure's first major boss character, Searchlights, or Voltris Luminera, which translates to lemon face. I, I don't know what about this creature screams lemon, but that's a question for Urban Shade, not me. The way this creature looks is gnarly. It'll hover over the sky on a set axis, and you need to avoid the beams it'll cast down, lest you get caught by its organic hooks and swallowed whole. There is something so beautifully haunting about this design. Sure, it's not like we haven't seen evil fish up until this point, but the implementation of human infrastructure like fish hooks into an organic deep sea predator is one of the most badass concepts I have seen in a while. The fight itself is kind of a cakewalk, just as long as you're patient. Definitely a relief compared to the last midway boss fight we had to do. You need to make sure you're out of the searchlight's line of sight and repair the set amount of generators for you to progress. Repairing the generators is the exact same as it was in the previous rooms, so just as long as you're attentive, you should be able to do this fairly easily. I believe this is a very good challenge. It isn't so hard you'll spend days trying to figure it out, but it's still extremely easy to mess up if you aren't paying enough attention. And, of course, the soundtrack still absolutely goes crazy. If your evasion skills are well enough, you'll be able to exit the room and continue to the next 30 or so. On your way there, you have the chance to traverse these server rooms or even green rooms that house trees and 
people growing out of moss. This is an entity known as Divine. It doesn't really serve any overarching purpose other than just being world dressing. It's stated to be the Black Site's main source of oxygen, supposedly giving better air quality than even the surface. We also have the chance to stumble across a room housing a sentient computer. Uh, what do you want? This is the painter, a sentient AI and self-proclaimed artist. Finally the first good AI artist. He doesn't do much, but he is the root cause of the good people's doors being rearranged as we enter those rooms, and is even the reason the turrets in the black side will target us. So although he doesn't seem to be overtly malicious towards us all the time, he still inadvertently wants us dead. He also seems to be allied with Sebastian in some way. Hmm. Traversing through more hallways, maintenance tunnels, offices, and whatever else we'll come across, if we stay by our wits, we may be able to see door 100. After this intercom interjection, we're given the ability to walk down to the airlock, and finally secure the crystal. Is it really okay for us to just be touching this with our bare hands? As the man on the intercom said, we are now left in the dark. Door 100 isn't where our journey ends. After this, we need to traverse 10 or so more doors, and they are absolutely brutal. A node entity will spawn every other door at minimum, and with the lights being completely off, you have nothing to rely on other than your sheer instinct, much like the greenhouse challenge indoors. Depending on your skill level, this may be the run ender for you. It certainly was for me on my first attempts. The strategy is genuinely just wait at a locker after every door you open. Even if you really think nothing is arriving, I assure you there's a 90% chance something has spawned. Pinky and Chainsmoker love taking their sweet time, so if you're feeling truly bold, maybe go two doors at a time, but this isn't recommended, considering Angler and Blitz move way quicker. Apart from node entities, everyone is still active and 10 times more aggressive. If you get a room with windows, chances are Ifestation will spawn. Since the rooms are all extremely dark, Squiddles will be on your tail the entire time. Even good people have the chance of spawning. It is dire out here. Around the halfway point, you'll start to hear something extremely strange. What almost sounds like an old German broadcast. If you stay in the radiance of this for too long, then... It's probably best not to stay in these rooms for too long next time. It hasn't been stated yet, but the prisoner diving gear we've been wearing all game is prone to explode if certain frequencies interfere with it. This likely causes a lot of early run endings, especially if you didn't know about this prior. It's unknown what exactly is special about this frequency to trigger it, or who could have even started this in the first place, but if you mandate to stay out of its proximity, you should go along unscathed. If you're able to survive survive the onslaught, you'll make it to another airlock, and conveniently, the backup generator turns back on, and we're given our final task. Sorry, confidential.
listening to the man on the intercom once more, heading to our final objective. Outside, we see this absolute goliath of a machine, only known to us as Lucy, lighting up the surrounding area for us. This visual would be intimidating alone, but as luck has it, being alone is a luxury down here. Here we are, the final skirmish in our path to salvation. The task is simple, needing to do basically the same as what we did last searchlight encounter, but on a much larger scale. The searchlight's pathfinding has also become a lot less predictable, making this a much greater challenge in every sense. And when I attempted this for the first time, I had to do it on just 19 health, so I really needed to be careful with those wires. But fear not, as you have the absolutely unprecedented best song in the entire OST to keep you occupied. I have deliberately not brought up the composer of Pressure until now, but that was mainly to applaud this track in particular. All of the music of this game was made by the artist Ren. Everything they have done for this game has been absolutely phenomenal, and this track is absolutely no exception. Search Party is particularly inspired by the song War Without Reason from the Ultra Kill soundtrack. Hey, I guess that's where the inspiration comes from. And just like that song, this song is also broken up into phases. Why exactly? Well... Oh boy. After every two wires you fix, a new searchlight will spawn in an effort to thwart your plans. With each hazard that comes in our way, the more intense the music will get. If we manage to fix each and every wire needed to power the cannon, we can flip the switch and start to make our escape. But just because our objective is complete, doesn't necessarily mean we're out of the clear. Dodging and weaving the searchlights as we make our way back, one even deliberately standing in our way, like it knows that we are personally here. We make it closer and closer back to our dock, escape just being out of reach, all before. Thanks, Lucy. We make our way back into the airlock and are given one final assignment. We're able to exit the building through another submarine, and with there not being much else for us to discover, we finally leave the Hadal Black site once and for all. The moment you arrive at the dock, a heavily armed guardsman forcibly takes the crystal container from you and brings it over to an old, decrepit, and disgusting looking man in a wheelchair with tank treads instead of wheels. He then opens the container to show it to the man. You don't quite hear exactly what he says to the guard, as other guards are leading you into a locker room to get you a new change of clothing. After putting on some civilian attire, you are escorted to a military vehicle. You are set to be put in the back seat with a fellow guardsman, as another guardsman gets into the driver's seat. Twelve minutes after leaving, the guardsman next to you gets a notification on his phone, takes it out, and starts reading something from it. Mr. Shade would like to thank you personally. Can someone find the record for the prisoner's name? For your valiant efforts in completing your task unscathed. Your criminal record has been purged, and the money has been deposited into your bank accounts under the guise of reprimands for false imprisonment. A fake news story will be published shortly to clear your image in which melody you originated from. He then puts his phone away and says nothing for the remainder of the drive. 
A few hours later, your car arrives at Vegar Airport. The guardsman next to you begrudgingly hands his phone to you and says, plane tickets are here. The password is... And that's the game! <laughs> Pressure is not only one of the best Roblox games I've played in a while, but it's definitely one of the best games I've played recently, period. It takes any criticism of it just being a Doors clone and completely throws it right back at the face of those who truly believe that. While I do believe there are many things in this project that are certainly derivative, the amount of effort and subtle changes to what we're used to when it comes to concepts like these really makes up for the similarities. Similarities, to the point where I think Pressure even does a few mechanics even better than Doors does. The ending is certainly a little lackluster and doesn't really leave much for our current protagonist to work with, but that's also weirdly refreshing in a way. The Prisoner's arc doesn't need to last several chapters that span for years to come. The story of our protagonist is very cut and dry, and is what I can only believe to be the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the secrets of Urban Shade. I have been putting off talking about the lore and extra content you can find throughout playing this game for a while, but there is so much interesting stuff here. First off, you've probably noticed this red individual following me in some of the gameplay I've been showing off. This is an imaginary friend, a remote that you can interact with that spawns this thing in solo runs. Thank you for using our limited time imaginary friend remote. We hope you enjoy the next two days with your very own real, not-so-imaginary friend. It doesn't do anything but just occasionally say words or phrases to you. It doesn't have any external importance to the plot or overarching story. It's just flavoring meant to flesh out Urban Shade more, and I love inclusions like this. You remember Sebastian? Yeah, yeah, that guy? The guy who sells us a bunch of items and stuff? Well, he's typically the one that breaks these stories to you as well. If you are to die in a run, instead of being given some brief synopsis on what caught you, you are given their entire case file. Sometimes a lot of the information is redacted at a time, meaning if you die over and over again to certain entities, you have the chance of filing up your information on your enemies after a while. Sebastian himself is someone you can learn much more about too. If you save up a thousand dollars worth of research in a run, you can buy his case file off of him, revealing many interesting details and factoids about him, such as the fact that he was framed for the murder of nine people and and was signed up for an experiment to give humans gills, which is what Tumblr sexy manified him. Sebastian is an extremely interesting character, the mascot of the entire game itself, and I have a feeling that even if our prisoner's journey has ended, we aren't going to be seeing the last of Sebastian anytime soon. This whole theme of adapting to your run over time and having the slight feeling of being canon not only parallels doors, but SCP containment breach at the same time. We remember each run we do, each death that we succumb to, and Sebastian likes to tease us for each one. Idiots! Behind you! Well, 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 How about I rip your stupid antenna off your head then what, bitch? This entire theme feels eerily similar to the story of D9341. There's a chance that we may be an anomaly in it of ourselves, and Urban Shade is none the wiser. The last story beat I really want to get into before wrapping this section up is the broader Roblox universe that seems to be building off this game's release. The YouTuber Dirog already brought up Pressure's ties to the Innovation Labs games, an old set of Roblox lab sims from years ago, but the stuff I'm more interested in, and what I believe many of you may also be more interested in, is the blatant connections to doors found in this game. Now, so this connection is certainly still very one-sided, but there's so much stuff in pressure to link it to doors that it goes beyond just easter eggs. Everything from being able to find the hotel's crucifix in light containment, to A60 from rooms literally having the chance to spawn in on one of your runs, and if you survive its encounter you are given the gummy flashlight, with a very detailed description on how Urban Shade found these. There's also this and like, what the fuck? Getting into all the story stuff 
regarding pressure would likely extend this video's runtime by double, and considering I have a sponsor deadline to meet in 7 days, I really can't do that. Sorry that I can't talk about how Stan from fucking Identity Fraud has the chance of spawning in the rooms occasionally. What I can say, however, is that if you love media like SCP or the backrooms, but feel like the openness of those mediums has gotten too suffocating, the lore and mysteries of Urban Shade is right up your alley. Since this is all being done by a very small team, the canon is much easier to keep track of than things such as those. So, if you're a fan of anomalies, monsters, and shady government practices, well, care to do some light reading? Roblox horror games are in a very interesting spot right now. For a while, it felt like we were just being fed the same repeat slop games that are so nothing I didn't even bother acknowledging up until this point. But once in a while, stuff like this will come up and really remind us what this platform is capable of. It would be nice to see more things like Doors or Pressure in the future that don't use this exact same format, but this roguelike horror genre that L Splash helped birth is so versatile that I believe so many things could still be made from it that feel just as creative and unique as Pressure does. Will we continue to see this level of quality from other devs, or will these two need to carry the whole medium on their backs for the foreseeable future? I'm not all too sure, but being optimistic hasn't let me down this far, so I'll be waiting. Maybe in another year's time, we'll return once more to our favorite block engine. As for now, we all know once Rainbow Friends Chapter 3 gets announced, it is over for these frauds. Thank you to my patrons, especially Aaron Persons, Lotus Ellis, James Bond Fan, Rickart12, Reverted Lotus, Pigpen, Sapphire Jewels, D for DJ, It's Juicy, Just Sam, Dusky, Spurlunk, Quinn, and Squeaks the Corgay. I have been Dags, and until next time, see ya.